Okay gang, good morning, good morning, good morning. Might be a normal stream here today, might be a very short stream, no idea. No idea, I'm just waiting for an email to come in from our web host to see what further action I need to take on the web problem. So we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. All I can do at the moment is uh, just uh, just get going on this. Nice day in Tokyo, it's a beautiful day, absolutely beautiful day. We're lucky now that the season has moved far enough on that even in the morning when it's a clear day, I can put the camera facing to the east. The sun is out of the way. Uh, all through the half of the year, the sun shines directly into the camera here, and I can't do that. But uh, today we're okay. The sun is gone. It's quiet here right now, but it's not going to be quiet much. It's going to be a, a busy day here in Asakusa. The crowd shuffles in. It's only 8 o'clock. <laughs> Okay, as I said, I might have to bail out here any minute now. For those of you who know what's going on, our website at the moment is down. It's been down for about eight hours. They took it down last night, about 15 minutes after I went to bed. Our web host has uh, closed us down. And uh, they're holding me to ransom. I know this has had three days in a row. This has happened three days in a row. They closed it down three days ago, saying there's malware suspected to be on your account which is quite possible. There's 40,000 pages and some insecure directories down deep in our older part of our account, which I should have taken care of a long time ago. So three days ago, I did what they asked. I changed all the directory permissions, went through, scanned myself, looked clean, couldn't find anything else. They opened it back up, said, good, thanks. Then the next day, this is Friday morning, I went to bed, normal time, woke up, they had closed it down again with the same form letter from a different guy in their service department. Just exactly the same form letter, ignoring what had happened the day before. I get in touch with them, I do it again, I scan, I scan, I scan, I can't find anything. And they say, oh, by the way, if, you know, for a fee of only $579 a year, you know, we can, like, help you find malware. And so it's three days in a row this has gone on. Where's the mic? The mic is right here. Anyway, so this morning I gave up. After three days with the same form mail, they shut me down at the same time of day, the same form mail comes. They've got me by the balls. This morning I agreed, okay, fine, that's it. Charge me the $600, whatever you have to do. They've got me by the short and curlies, so uh, nothing I can do. They have a scanner running. Okay, they, won't, they will only scan for free 10,000 files. Now, I've been scanning all through this thing myself. I've got my own little robots that run through scanning but mine are obviously not so sophisticated. I don't know how to catch all the latest versions of malware. There may or may not even be any malware on there. I don't know, I can't tell. Their system, now the same form mail, three days in a row, says that there is. And it really, really to me sounds like very unethical business behavior. Whatever, I have no choice. They have our website closed down. Every hour that it's down costs me more than the fee they're asking me to do this. So I told them this morning, go ahead, I'll pay the money, do what you want, just open it up, please. So I'm waiting now for the response from them. Here's mail, just a sec, excuse me, one second. No, not from them. And now we're in the hunt for a new server, a new hosting company after I get this cleared up a new hosting company at the moment. This used to be a really good company. They're called Pair Networks. They used to be wonderful. The service was wonderful. It used to be owned by a guy called Kevin. We signed up with him in, in, in 1997, 1996 or 1997, we signed up with him. When it was only, he only had like four servers in his basement or something. It was really cool. And there was a support group. We all chatted with each other and all that kind of stuff. Now he sold out to a, to a corporate entity some years ago, and now it's just whatever. It's a corporate entity. So. Uh, so whatever. So we'll, we're in the hunt later, not today. We're in the hunt for a new web host, you know, uh, hosting service. So. so what you could do in the background there, if you go to mochahunkan.com right now, you'll see it's locked. If somebody can check every few minutes and see if they do actually open it up and give us this news. All right, what am I supposed to be doing here? Work. Okay. At all. What's the priority? Kabul sounds Prince need embossing, but honestly speaking, it's not a priority. So let's do some carving. Mm. 
let's do some carving. Okay, what were we at yesterday? We were clearing away here. We got to a bunch of it done. I've dur during this morning, while I've been waiting for people to get here and stuff, I've uh, I did some persuading. So I need to do a tiny bit more persuading, light persuading here, and then I can get in and do some quiet work. So let's do it. Follow the same pattern as yesterday. Paper is out. No paper is out. Nobody is here today. The printers they did they've done the last few days. There were three printers here yesterday. Uh, to the day before. There are no printers here today, right now. So it's just me in the building. For the shop, the shop staff will be coming here around 9 or 9.30. The last few days in the shop, I should have prepared some charts for you. We're back. We're back. My God, we're back. The numbers of tourists into the country at the moment are running 20%. I saw a news report yesterday. They're running about 20% of the, the previous Quant, uh, you know, uh, count of tourists coming in. The count is still very low, but Mokong is back. My God, it's back. And what's also a surprise is the shop has picked up hugely, and it doesn't seem to have affected online or subscriptions. You know, two and a half years ago, the shop disappeared and online picked up. Now the shop is picking up, and online is picking up even more. And I know, I think I mentioned this the other day, the other week, you know, we are running out of prints, absolutely running out of prints. How do the printers like the thick papers? I haven't heard back from them. I did it, I passed it all out to them. I did the sizing on Thursday, Friday, I passed out the paper to the printers, and I haven't heard back from them yet. So we'll see. Sometime early next week, they will be testing that paper that I got. glasses. We talked about the backwards grain. This corner is specifically really, really difficult. Every time I try and put the chisel in the wrong way around, it splits up really. You can see it all the way. I was trying to carve against the grain and there's no way. Look at this, it just splits straight away. Okay, I think we've got enough to do with the, with the chisels. Yeah, I'm going to zoom a bit. Once I get the, this work done, now we'll zoom in. Just a sec. I just wanted to get enough cleared to make it worthwhile working with the other chisels. Just a sec. zone. Now let's zoom in. Push in, pull out. Am I going to watch the World Cup, Dave? <laughs> like you needed to ask that question? Really? You needed to ask that question? <laughs> What's the World Cup? Well, I know what it is, but no, I won't be, you know, I won't be watching the World Cup. I'm sorry. Why did I move to Japan when I can chisel wood in my own country? Well, it's a long story. <laughs> it really is a long story, like it's a 35 year long story, more. Anybody can chisel wood anywhere in the world, but uh, when you're looking to learn how a specific kind of chiseling is done, with a specific kind of materials and a specific kind of tools, 
and you don't have those materials and tools and workers in your own country, and there's no internet, then you gotta, you know, you gotta get over there where they are doing that thing and observe the people who are doing it. So in, in, a, in one sentence, that's why I came to Japan, to learn how to do this stuff, because this is where it was. And there wasn't any of this kind of work being done anywhere else, I mean, in the, the traditional Japanese work. So I came on a three-month tourist visa to learn more about it, and I'm still here. Oops, okay, let's get this right. Hey, camera, camera, camera. So if I'm going to move around, we're going to have to zoom out a bit more. Okay, where am I? Come on. Where do I want to be? Okay, here we want to be. This is the area. Okay. This is a strange and difficult piece of wood, you know. It's so, I don't know, it's brittle in places, it's rock hard in places. These inclusions that you see here are just like stone. Ooh, just like stone. Okay, same as we saw the other day when we're doing this, we have a staged group of chisels. I can't get in here now. This chisel is a bit too wide to go inside here. So we'll do what we can with this one chisel. And then I have to switch down to the next size down. Now we're going down, I guess that's from a 12 to a 6. So we'll jump down to a 6.
Okay, let's get inside. Yeah, the, you know, if this block was going to be used, you know, this, this thing about these hard spots that are in here, if this block were going to be used for a single smooth, like if it was going to be like printing a smooth color, something like this, then those inclusions would really cause a problem. But this block is going to be used for what is partly a multi-overlaid color. There's going to be a base blue, then this is a slightly darker blue. So these inclusions would maybe affect, maybe in the worst case, they would affect that second blue layer a little bit, but because this is overlaid, we're probably going to be okay. And when I did pick it up, this, this, this single large one there, when we were choosing this wood, it's in a non-printable area. There are going to be some, there are inevitably also going to be some here and there in the areas that we're printing. But because this is an overlaid color, in some cases triple overlaid, I think we're okay. We'll see. We'll see, we'll see. When I did that long three-hour stream, the, the print of the, the onsen, the, the, the girl sitting in the water, the piece of what I chose for that, I hadn't really expected that project to be all that important. It was just sort of a throwaway. Let's see if we can show on one stream how to carve a block. And I picked the image because it was simple without too many colors, and because I thought I could do it in like a 90-minute stream. It turned out I should have been a bit more careful with that because that print that I made that day on the stream has turned out to be one of our best sellers. And it also turns out that in the middle of this water on that block, there is an inclusion similar to these dark ones. So all of our printers are sweating with that. They're trying to get a good smooth teal color on the background of that print. And yet there is this inclusion on it. And we know how to sort of deal with this. The problem with the inclusions is that they are too hard compared to the wood nearby them. So when you put the pigment on, the water soaks into the general wood, but it doesn't soak into the part where the inclusion is. So you get a difference in the color tone there. It's actually the color doesn't come out as deep and strong as the areas around it. So what we've tried to do with that block is the inclusion on it in the middle of the water. I have done this. I have tap, 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 poke, 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 tap, 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 poke, 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 made a number of tiny holes in it. And that helps absorb the water and it helps it, but it doesn't last for long. You're going to come back and do it again and do it again and do it again. And every time we run out of that print and we have to call for some more copies from one of the carvers, they all go, not me, not me, they all point to the next person, not me, <laughs> somebody else can do it. <laughs> It's the one they least like to work on here at Mokohanka, and it's one of our best sellers. So. I should have been a bit more careful choosing the wood, but I, I really, I thought it was a toss-away project. I really didn't think it was going to turn out to become a monster. What I really should do is, because it's so easy to make, I should just carve another block for that one. So, Tom is saying it, so I, I really should. It's just a question of getting time to schedule it, you know. I mean, it didn't even take three hours, the carving, to carve that part of the block. If I didn't have a stream running, I could just do it in an hour or so. So I should just grab another piece of wood and do it. All the things that I should be doing, I know, I know, I know. I should do this, I should do that, I should do this. 
the, the girls are panicking, you know, Ayano-san and Aya-san. I, when I say panicking, what I mean is, you know, they're, they're doing their jobs normally, but whatever. But they are now, they're really worried that I have made such small amount of progress on next year's subscription series. They see that I haven't even started carving the block yet. They haven't had a chance to order the packaging yet because we haven't had our meeting about it. They are starting now to get nervous that Dave is a dereliction of duty and uh, I have got to get the organization work done for next year's subscription series for both of them. Lots of things, lots of things. Part of the reason for the delay in getting next year's series organized is not, well, X percent procrastination, I guess, I don't know. The decisions are all made. We know what we're doing. It's all done. But there's been delays, you know. The whole, I think, I talked to you, we're, we're planning on doing it with a different kind of paper. And we ordered test paper for that months ago, long in advance of what I thought was okay for it. And the paper didn't show up, and the paper didn't show up, and we don't want to bug the guy because, you know, he's a good, good worker and a friend, and we don't want to bug him. And finally, we phoned in desperation. This would have been, I told you the story, it was about a couple of weeks ago. We phoned and said, I know, about that paper we asked, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, okay, I'll get to it right now, you know. <laughs> Dave face palms, and his whole work for next year has been waiting on this little one <laughs> delivery of, of paper. <laughs> so whatever. <laughs> I shouldn't have. Uh, I shouldn't have. Did it. I should have gone ahead with other parts of the project. You know, <laughs> we can't decide on the packaging, and we can't order the envelopes, and we can't do that sort of stuff until we know what size the print is going to be. And until I had done some test printing on paper type A and paper type B, we wouldn't know <laughs> what what it was. Uh, I'm not blaming the other guy. It's my own procrastination for most of this. But in that particular one, I had just delayed my other work until we get this paper tested. Once we get the paper tested, then I can move ahead and do the rest of it, you know. And he says that they, oh, yeah, yeah, I meant to get around to that. I forgot about it. You know, so whatever. And the reason we're changing paper is because the prints are totally, completely different from anything we've ever made before. We're sort of reproducing an original print, and the original prints prints in this series or set or type of print would not have ever been made on whole show paper. So changing paper was sort of a part of the deal. This series we're planning needs different paper. Anyway, whatever, combination of different things all together. So. Make the envelope a couple of millimeters big around the edges this time around. What, I don't know, which, which particular envelope are you talking about, John? Oh, you must be talking about this year's series, ED series. That envelope size is not my choice. The envelope size is decided by the post office. The post office here, maybe post offices around the world, I don't know. They have, here in Japan, it's called teike, I know, specific standard dimensions for envelopes. They're all set by the, by the system. And if you are one millimeter larger in your envelope, then you pay much, much more. The postage fee for teike and teike gai outside of the, outside of the set dimensions is completely different. 
And I get it, they want envelopes that go through their sorting machines, whatever, and if the envelope's too big, it doesn't go through the sorting machine, do it by hand, cost more money. So I guess I get it, I get it. So those envelope sizes are determined by the post office. And this is one of the things that has been holding us back for next year. Because until I can, I can't yet decide type A, B, C, or D. You make the stuff inside the envelope, and this year it's going to be the print. So the print, the, the dimensions of the design part of the print are decided. What is not decided is how much border there's going to be around the print. I don't have a print in front of me, but yeah, there's the design element and then there's the border part. And this year we want a wider border part, but we can't decide what it's going to be until we get the sample paper and make the stuff. And then we do the packaging and we're either going to have to stick with this envelope or we have to bite the bullet, go up to that one and charge more for postage. So we're, we're aware of this and we're on it, but I can't make all the decisions here until I get all the, all the different pieces. Also, the thing you're complaining about, that it's tight, that really, really, really helps make that envelope more stable. It makes it stiffer, it makes it more or less likely to bend and get damaged as it goes forward. So that's sort of, again, this is another one of those little phrases, bug feature. You're thinking about this as a bug, but the tightness in there is something that we are actually, uh, within reason, we are trying to achieve to make that thing as stiff and as stable as possible. And if it takes you five seconds more to get in there, but we get X percent less damage along the way, then, uh, then that's what it is. Ho, ho, browned and around, wood grain, wood grain. Have you said anything about our website? Yes, we're waiting on a malware scan. Our website has been shut down by my ISP, not, not my ISP here, by my web, web provider in Pittsburgh. Three days in a row they've shut it down. Three days in a row I have tried to follow their instructions about getting it back up. And every one of those three days, letters have come from their sales department advertising their malware protection service. So there's a, there's a bit of you know, hostage taking going here. And in order to get the website back up, I have paid them for their malware service. There at the moment, their robot, they're probably just sitting drinking coffee, but whatever. They say they are scanning it. I don't know why it should be taking so long. I myself have scans that run through the website in, in a matter of minutes. Anyway, we're waiting on their professional, extremely efficient malware scanning service to deliver me a result, at which point I have to go in and remove the malware and they will open up. So thank you, I'm, I'm on it. I don't seem to be doing anything at the moment, but I'm on it. And I may have to abandon the stream any minute once I receive a note from my web hoster. I've got an email window open here. Taran san, I meant to write to you last night. Aimi san was here yesterday. She's cool for next Saturday. Taran san, are you cool for next Saturday? Let me know about this. Let me know, please, Taran san. If, it's, if you're okay for next Saturday for the test printing on those Hiroshi Yoshida blocks, let us know. Where was I? Up here. I can't even remember what I'm doing. Taransan has been waiting for my response here. He's done his first part of that Hiroshi Yoshida carving project. He's carved a bunch of, of color blocks as a starting point for the color separation work, which is going to be very, very complicated. And he's carved, I don't know, a half dozen or so color blocks. 
And we have to now test these and proof these and put the base of the image in place and then move ahead and try and decide more colors on top of this. But we need to test first. Next Saturday, I've worked from two to five. Okay, let, let me, let's talk about this then. Uh, I, can, I can ask Amy to come early maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay, but could you do that in the morning then? Is that okay? If it turns out to be okay for her? This one's dangerous. Here's a place where in the early days I would have chipped this off. Absolutely. The wood we want to keep here is a triangle shape like this going out to a point. This wood right here has to come away. But if I keep going like this right now, boom, 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 it's really risky that when I get to about here, not just this wood disappears, but the triangle pops off as well. So I'm going to cut a little deeper here, a bit of insurance, step one. But even that, still nervous. I can probably get away with this, but the risk is high. So I'm going to turn around and come in. Come in from the other side. So there's much less risk of popping off the top of that triangle. But if you were to study a bunch of my earlier prints, I'm sure, going back in the early parts of the Poet series, Look inside some of the color blocks. You're probably going to see any number of similar triangles with corners missing. And Dave's like, mm, maybe nobody will notice. Let's see. I don't know. Oh, Taranzan is posting some video. At last. <laughs> like Dave's talking. Where's the, where's the video? Where's the video? There's something else that has happened both yesterday and today that I find both uh, uh, what's interesting and I find it both uh, heartwarming and also really you know, uh, uh, not so good. Yesterday, during the night here in Japan, our Mokohangam website was for the most part shut down by our ISP. So most of the, in America during the day yesterday and then also during the day today, the website has been not available. But when they pulled the plug on it, what they did was they didn't just erase it from the internet. They didn't change the domain name or anything. What they did was they just simply made it password protected. So if you <coughs> went to our Mokohangan webpage right now, you'll see you need a password to log in. 
because what they did was they're, they're expecting me to be able to do maintenance, so I still need to get in there to do maintenance, so they gave me a password. But the effect of having the website now password locked, there are lots of people out there apparently who think that I have done this, that I have made Moko Hong Kong into uh, a service where you have to have a login to be able to access it. And last night, when I got up in the mail, when I got up this morning, looked at the mail, last night three people signed up to Patreon, thinking that this would get them a login for the website. And last night, two nights ago, the same thing, two people. So five people in the last few days, because the web hoster has shut it down and put a password on it, it has increased people. Of course, emails are coming. How do I get my passport? What do I have to do? And five people, two yesterday and three today, have signed up for Patreon, thinking that this is going to set them up. So I'm going, to, I'm going to have to write to them and say, please, you know, whatever, this is not what's happening. Please cancel your Patreon. This is not the idea to do this. So I haven't written to them yet. I'm going to wait till this is all over and I can get, get back to normal. But, uh, but my God, just I'm sort of upset to have people think that I would do such a thing, that I would ask money for access to our website. You know, like I would, I'm not that kind of person. And yet these people, not only they think I'm like that, they happily paid or, or unhappily paid or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to think about this. My God. I keep checking for mail, checking for mail. I don't see anything from the web host company. Ananda, ananda, ananda. If this uh, thread, if this stream today does continue on normally, you know, if, if something happens with our website or something doesn't happen, it doesn't need my attention. I can stay here and do this. Then show we will get to show and tell time. And for show and tell time today, I of course I have that album that we looked at the other day. Yes, they are U.S. based, and it is Friday afternoon. And just before I started the stream here, I spoke on the telephone to their service guy or one of their service people, a guy called TJ. And I asked him specifically about this. I said, look, it's Friday evening over there right now, Friday afternoon. Is this, can this be resolved before the weekend, or are your guys all going to book off Friday night and I won't hear anything from you for a few days and my website will be down all across the weekend? And he said, well, I can't guarantee anything, but we'll, uh, we'll try and make that happen. Thanks, guy. You know, this is Friday night. They closed the website down eight hours ago, but I didn't see it. It's been closed all day, U.S. time, but I didn't see it because I was, you know, asleep. No, I can't uh, tell you the password. I'm sorry. And if they specifically mention this, don't try and subvert this by publishing the password. And I mean, that makes sense, obviously. So I'm sorry. I can't do that. And if I piss those guys off even more, you know, already I'm in, I'm in a little bit of trouble with some of their service guys because I have been a little bit, you know, not, I haven't been upset and yelling and screaming, but I did make my, make my thoughts known that I was disappointed after being a customer for 26 years that they would do that. And they would do it three freaking days in a row. So yeah, whatever, 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 whatever. Get off my lawn.
Yes, I've been trying to track down the bad files. I have found a couple, a couple, but nothing actually that would be uh, malicious and dangerous to anybody else. And uh, we found a couple uh, that were adding Google ads. They were injecting Google ads to the page. It's a common thing for people's browsers to be hacked and your browser has a malicious JavaScript or something so that when you visit any page, more ads are injected to the page. The same sort of thing happened on our site this week where there was a piece of malware in our site that was injecting ads into the code as it's stored on my site. So this is server side, nothing to do with the, with the browsers. And this is nothing to do with SQL injection, something like that. There's simply a, a bot, whatever there, that is, that is editing our files before they get sent out. And it's really, really curious what it is. It seems to be running as my username. They won't give me access to the server logs. I have the uh, FTP logs and I have the web logs. And those things show no un untoward access. The same file that gets changed and edited is not being changed in the FTP logs. But they won't give me the Apache logs so that I can't tell where the malware is. So. Anyway, enough of that, enough of that. Yeah, 26 years. The thing is, the kids don't know it. I mean, the kid I've dealt with this morning, he's probably not even 26 years old. He doesn't care. He doesn't know. And it was the same form letter. Three days in a row, the same form letter with a different person's name at the bottom. These are probably not even real people. Anyway, as I was starting to see before I got distracted, I know. Yeah. Uh, the show and tell today. So I have the, the same set of prints that we started to look at the other day. I haven't had a whole lot of time to really study it in depth, but I've learned a bit more about it. There is, there's paperwork, as you saw yesterday, Included with the prints, there's a bunch of advertising material and a bunch of wrapping included with the prints. And they show some pretty interesting things. So I think, so for show and tell today, what I think we'll do is we'll look again at that album that came yesterday because we have in no way, I don't know, exhausted it at all. <laughs> but I also have another box that I would like to open. So let's do this. We'll, if we have time today, we will open the other box and just take a peek at what's inside. And then we will go over to the Hiroshige album of, of large prints that we received the other day. Assuming we get that far in the stream, if I don't have to jump. This group should be no problem because this is with the grain. The chisel wants to run this way smoothly. Says he digging into wrong grain.
got it. This one here, got it. Okay, this area. Couldn't a machine do this faster? <laughs> Are we back to that again? <laughs> this is a recording. This is a recording. <laughs> it's okay. No, people drop in a, on the on this thing here, and many, many people ask the same question, of course. Wait, this could be automated. Machines could do this much faster. Machines can indeed do this much faster, quote, unquote. The idea of printing, making images on paper, has evolved in many, many ways over the centuries. And there are some extremely efficient machines available these days that do printing very, very quickly, very, very efficiently, very, very beautifully. It's a different kind of printing. I don't know the, the person who is new here who has asked this question right now. It's a very, very long story, but in a nutshell, what we're trying to do here is not find an efficient way to put an image on paper. What we are doing is we are making a specific object, the thing that's called a Japanese woodblock print. And although it looks like an image on paper, and it is an image on paper, it differs in, in many, many ways from a typical thing that you hold in your hand on paper and look at, like a magazine page or a book or something like this. A, a, a typical magazine page color, wow, that's a nice picture. That can indeed be efficiently done by machine. The object that we, we call a Japanese woodblock print, although it looks like a picture to you, it looks like a picture, it's actually something else. It's a three-dimensional object with an image content as part of what it is, and then a physical, a bunch of physical attributes. The, the high touchable quality of the handmade paper, the feel and depth of the pigment in that paper, front and back, the whole it gets to be, I start sounding a little bit, bit, I don't know, metaphysical. The holistic aspect of the whole thing, the touch and feel and the knowledge of how it was made and the, the parts that are done beautifully and the parts that are done a little bit, you can see the handmade feeling. All of these things blend together in a way that gives this object a beauty and a, and a desire to touch and hold and feel that doesn't exist in a simple picture. And part of the beauty in the final thing is the process that it took to make it. And yes, a router could have gone faster than I can do this, but so what? Dave actually here is having fun doing this. It's not, I kind of keep coming back to the same thing, you know. This is not something I'm trying to avoid. I like doing this work, and it results in a beautiful, beautiful result and the combination of those two things give meaning to my life in this, give meaning to this part of my life. I have other aspects to life as well. But pleasant, peaceful, wonderful work using my body to make a beautiful result, I got no problem with this at all. And if some parts of my work could be maybe done faster by a noisy, awful, god-awful, disgusting machine, I want no part of that. Anyway, it doesn't, if you're brand new here and you're just seeing this, it sort of doesn't make any sense. But if you hang around for a while and get to see the mood of the work and the feeling and the different results that come from the work, then you could be, come to understand why we actually still do this. Thing. 
We're not just making buggy whips. There was too much mulberry in the paper. I'm sorry, that makes no sense. So our paper is made of mulberry. There's nothing but mulberry in there. So I think perhaps what you're confusing there with, I may have made a statement like there is too much chidi in the paper. There are too many bark scraps. There are too many inclusions. The paper is made of mulberry though. It should be clean and clear. The paper we're getting these days is not quite as clean and clear as it should be. It's very, very difficult handwork. And it sort of goes against what I just said a moment ago. We ourselves are trying to do some simple experiments in methods of automating that part of the job because the human beings have given up on doing it properly. So that part of the job, we are really thinking of seeing how we can automate. Not the chiseling part here because we still like doing this. There's a mail here. I gotta check and see if the mail is from our IP, our provider. Nope. I don't think we don't do apprentices or interns, so I don't know. I don't think there's any bot command there, just except it says no. <laughs> We don't do interns, but there's, there's sort of something here that happens that's close to this. And the young lady here in, in, as one of the mods, she could explain to this better than I can, Vivid San here. She has been here the first time she came a few years ago. It was sort of like an intern. I don't know. Describe it that way. I don't know. She, she showed us some of her woodblock prints. They seemed really artfully done, nicely done. And I saw a person who was deeply interested in doing this, a person who was not just one of those people who talk about doing it, but one of those people who actually have an interest and then do something about it. And she showed me, I either, did you send them over, Vivid? I can't remember. You showed me an image of some prints or you actually sent me some prints. And I looked at these prints that she had seen, that she had made. They were, you know, beginner type prints. It was okay, but there was an artfulness in there. And this person was serious. And this was one of these people who, like I said, does things. So I must have made the offer, look, come on over. If you're in Japan, you can use some of our space. You know, we can't hire you. We're not going to be, you're not going to be a, a student. You're not going to be an apprentice. But if you want to hang out here a while and use some of the workspaces and chat with the printers, I think it would be valuable to you. Something like that, right? I don't remember how it actually started. And there, there it is. So we, it's still an open offer. Over the years, how many people have done this? Karen has come. Uh, John Amos from Georgia came. He spent like a, a month here. He rented an apartment for a month and came here. And I think it was valuable to him. Again, he's not my student. He's an independent printer of his, on his own. But he hung out here. Fabiola San from, from, I can't pronounce it, the place in Spain that starts with a Z, Zara. I can't pronounce it. I can't even try to pretend to pronounce it. It starts with Z-A-R-A-G, something like this. So she came as well and learned a whole bunch. So that offer is, is sort of open. We don't advertise it. We don't talk about it, says Dave, talking about it on a live stream. But the, the point is there, that if we see that there's somebody out there who is doing great work, the potential for great work, who is really serious, who is clearly not going to quit, in the next three weeks or whatever, then we make an offer, say, look, come on, hang around here if you like. You can, you can hang out. So that's there, that offer is there, but it's not an internship, it's not an apprenticeship. There's no place on our website where you can go to read more about this. It's just Dave's quiet background policy. And the number one factor maybe in my decision to say to each of these people, hey, why don't you come on over, would be they have pretty much convinced me that they're not going to quit, that they're doing this, that there's meaning in this, that by spending me spending time with them, they're not just going to say, gee, that was nice, and then six months later, there's nothing. Because in the early years of doing this, I did. I, I put the same offer to no names, the, the, the whatever, not this person, and there was that person, 
I did this. I invited them in. They slept here. They stayed here, blah, blah, blah. It was kind of like a, an internship sort of thing. And, and in each of those cases in those years, because I wasn't selective enough, they really enjoyed it. They learned a lot. Bang. And then never heard anything from them. No prints, no production. So this is, this is the key. The, these people, the ones I'm mentioning now, Fabiola San, John Amos, Vivid, Vivid San, they convinced me, or, or I, I came to believe that they were in this for, for the long term. And so far, I was right. All three of those people are now not only making prints, they've joined this team in the sense of proselytizing and helping other people get interested in spreading the work around. So those three people, absolutely. I was absolutely right in saying, hey, come on over if you like, and maybe you can, you know, maybe you can make use of some of the facilities here. Three perfect examples. I have the feeling that there's a fourth person. I can't remember the name. Just a minute. I should, I should, I'm going to be in trouble here. Somebody else important. I can't remember. It was John Amos. Fabiola San, Karen, but somebody else before that. I'm going to be really, really embarrassed about this. There's somebody else who came under similar circumstances, stayed out, stayed a while here, made a bunch of prints, and is still making prints. My God, I can't remember. I'm going to be in trouble. Taransan's here on the street. He never got a chance to do that, actually, you know. Taransan came. Taransan came, and uh, because we had you know, not been available to him, Taransan went to Aska Sensei's place and became an actual formal apprentice. So Taransan would, would be, of course, you know, somebody else who could be eligible for this. If Taransan had nothing else going on, <coughs> he would, of course, be totally free to, to use whatever facilities we have here as much as he wanted, you know. But Taransan's okay. He's up on his own. He has an actual formal teacher. Doesn't need me. He's, he's doing a different approach to this. So. our time. Oh, 10 more seconds. And there we are. It's 9 o'clock on a Saturday. Here in Tokyo, anyway. Nine o'clock on a Saturday. And the regular shufflers crowd in.
I think it's the vegetable guy, is it? I didn't see him come in. Was that the white vegetable truck that just came in? William Francis. Yeah, William was different, actually. William was different. William wasn't here by that kind of invitation. William was here. We, we hired William as a cabinet maker. <laughs> this was, what, four years ago when we were opening the first four shop here. So William actually wasn't here as, as a, to do any printing and stuff. We, we hired William to, to help us build cabinets and stuff. That was a different, uh, different kind of event. Camilo. Camilo's never been here. I've met him once. He's visited the shop. I met him. He's never uh, stayed here and worked here. Where did he go? He was at the Me Lab program, was it? I don't know. Or was he with Terry up in uh, Karuizawa? I really don't know. I'm sorry. I've only met the man once. He, he visited. We chatted for a while here. I think it was Me Lab he must have gone to. Lots of people have done that, the, the Me Lab program, which has been going for going on and off for years. There's tons of people have come through and done that. I mean we're not the only game in town these days. You know, we were a long time ago, but we're not the only place now to learn about woodbot prints. It's not the tourists per se that Mokohankan is so much interested in, but uh, the fact that tourism is back in Japan means that our fans can get here. So, the other end of the block, the grain went that way, up here it goes this way. Never ending and all. I think everything's cut here now. We have to do more clearing around here. That's too close, but that would be noisy. We don't need to do that right now. Oh, here's a little piece I missed. Look at this. This has got to come out the inside here. And we've got one more here. I didn't cut this yet. So, ah, so, ah. so we're not finished this block yet.
Okay, that's the main cutting part finished. The next step would be noise making, and there's no point starting noise making here at 9.09. .09. Let's have a look. Pull out, push in. Here's the block as it will sit facing the printer. The registration marks are here in the corner and here. This area is all carved and cleared. This is carved and cleared. This is carved but not cleared. We'll have to get rid of the waste wood around here. This is carved and cleared. We'll need to get rid of more waste here. That's a bit too close. If the printer was rubbing color here, it would bang this part. So I've got a scoop away here. And then of course, this whole corner, the printer will need to rub pigment on here, which means this whole area somewhere from around here will have to come out. This has to come out. So we'll just take it down to here. So all this area here will need to come out next, but I'm not going to sit here making noise right now, not with just a few minutes left in the stream. And then when that's done, we move on to number four. We've got blue blocks now. We've got blue blocks everywhere. Blue block number one for the entire base of all the blue color. Blue block number two, which overlays and deepens a certain part of it. Let me get the same orientation. So you can perhaps see how it's going to work. These places mix in here. Look at that one. That one there is what goes in here. That one goes in there. This one goes in here. So they're going to overlap and make different blues in the final print. This one's ready for going. This one will be ready to go soon. That's one, two, three, and four. Then when those are done, we then move on to the other color blocks. There will be a red color block for her clothes. There will be two or three color blocks for the surfboard. We'll need lips and we'll need another hair block. Step by step by step. Wind. It's a bit windy. It's a bit windy. Okay, let's move on. Show and tell, show and tell, show and tell. As I said, for the main show and tell today, we'll look again at that album of Hiroshige prints that I scored the other day, scored that I bought. But before we do that, I have something else to open. And this is a flyer. This is Yahoo Auctions, and it may be really, really, really useful for us. It may be not so useful. It may be something that we can't use, but other printmakers could use, in which case we'll pass it on, or it could be something that it's just totally not useful for woodblock printmaking at all. The guy described it properly, but whether it's of a type we can use, I don't know. Let's crack it and I'll show you what's inside. And again, our unbroken streak of no green tape. I don't know what's happening. For a while there, every package we were opening was covered with green tape, and now Nothing. That's become a, a, a meme that is no longer relevant. So again, this could be junk or treasure. I don't know. It won't be, it won't be super treasure, but it could be junk or useful. Let's put it like that. We do not need to keep this paper back, so let's just cut it. You can probably see where this is going. It is paper. It's got a brand name, and I'm not sure how to pronounce it. The character would be Kyo or uh, to say, or she, it's the she and Shimizu. It's the Kyo Mizu Dera Kyo, clean, and this is air, Kaze, Hu. But I'm not sure how the pronunciation, Kyo, I don't know how they would pronounce the combination. 
What's the pronunciations for this one? Kyo or Shi or Sei? Sei Fu? I don't know. I don't know the pronunciation. But I don't care about that. What I did care when I saw the auction was this one. And this says Gampi. We have some Gampi paper. Now, this is not Gampi paper aimed at woodblock printmaking preparation. This is Gampi paper aimed at people who were doing calligraphy. So it's thin Gampi for doing calligraphy or for drawing. Some say, can't say food, a show brush of fresh air, I guess so, clean and clean and breeze, clean and wind, clean, fresh wind. So let's see. But Gampi it's supposed to be, and is it going to be useful for us for doing our transfers? I don't know. Another pronunciation, so, so. This is past my pay grade. I really don't know. Thank you, Rangaksha. Tarankan says, say fu. So, so, I really don't know. I'm going to keep quiet. Yeah, it's paper for drawing and calligraphy. It's laid up the same way that gasenshi, calligraphy paper, is made. I wouldn't, if I was just looking at the sheet, I wouldn't know that it was actually made from gumpy fibers. I don't know. We are going to test some. Next time I do some spraying up to do some transfer sheets, I will take some of this paper and spray it up and see how it works. This is not all that old. Before we got that package of antique gumpy, which was running about a hundred years ago, Okay, there it is. We'll throw this in the pot for testing. You may think this is no big deal, but the way that paper making is going in Japan now, with nobody able to make good quality paper, for us to score how many sheets are going to be in there. That's a thousand sheets, and there's two decks of it. For me to score 2,000 sheets of Gumpy, if it's usable, this would be like enough for the rest of my life and on, on. So we are everywhere I can see it. We are grabbing paper that seems to be useful. Every night of the week, I'm on Yahoo Auction looking for washi. Every night of the week, I'm looking for washi, for brush hair, for brushes, for blocks, you name it. That gives every indication of being useful for us for making the two-layer hanshita paper. Oh, this is different. This is not the same stuff. This is not the same paper. No, this is calligraphy paper. No, this is pulp. Doesn't matter. Win one, lose one. A thousand sheets of gumpy now in stock. Okay, let's get this out of the way. <laughs> Careful, Dave, don't drop this thing. To the real treasures. Back to the real treasures. Okay, we've had a chance to look at this. I know the last couple of days have been real chaos, so I haven't learned all there is to learn about this. But a couple of things I can show you. When we opened this the other day, we saw that there was prints at the bottom and there was a box. There's lots of room in the box for more prints. And I mentioned to you that the auction person had described it wasn't a full set. The way they've published this set is 69 prints plus a table of contents, making 70 altogether, and they published it as a subscription. And what we have here now is an advertisement for the subscription, explaining in chapter and verse what they were trying to reproduce, how they did it, what the prices were going to be, and how the subscription package was working. And here's the outline of how the thing was being set up. 
Now, unfortunately, I can't read the numbers on some of this. It's old-fashioned numbering. So when Mori-san gets here in a few minutes, she's going to have to help translate for us. But here's the deal. They got the first package, and then it's number two, three, four, five, six, seven. There were eight packages in all that were shipped to you. The first pack, uh, you can see, it. here's the, here. There's nine, 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 eight, 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 eight prints. So the first package would have included the box, a pull out, push back. The first package would have included the box itself, and then a bunch of prints, and along with this. And then month by month, in the second month, third month, and fourth month. Now, the way they were setting this up, they prepared it, but they didn't say in January, here's what you get, in February, here's what you get. They did it as starting month, second month, third month, fourth month. And it says they were going to make 500 sets. In the description here, it says the plan was that they are going to make 500 of these sets. There's no numbers on anywhere of these that I can detect that I haven't seen yet, but they said there was going to be 500 sets. Now, what we have here, and we have the actual envelopes that were used to send the subscription prints out. The first one came in the box in a big package, but then following a certain time later came Dai, Dai Nikai, the second package from Kyoto. And we have number two, the envelopes for number two, three, four, five, and then six. And we don't have an envelope for seven or eight. And guess which prints are missing here? It is indeed the prints that would have come with number seven and number eight. There's a table of contents, package one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Eighteen prints are missing from our set, as are the envelopes. So somebody started a subscription, rolled along for six months, and then didn't finish their subscription. And I've got to write to these guys. The publisher still exists. We talked about this yesterday. I showed you their website. The publisher still exists. So we have got to write him a really, really cool letter. And we're going to do this. Me and Aoyama-san are going to do this later on in the week. Or maybe, maybe Ayano-san. She'll be more willing to play along with me like this. We're wondering if we can perhaps pick up a subscription we didn't finish back in 1913 or Taisho, whatever it was. <laughs> Because if they did make 500 of each and somebody didn't finish their subscription, they must have some prints left over there, right? We're going to try. We're going to write to them and see. Can we get <laughs> I can guess what will probably happen. They'll say, sure, actually, yeah, we can pick up the 18 prints and $200 each, you know, inflation, whatever it is. So 18 prints at $200 each, just send us $3,600 and we'll happily send you the rest of the prints in the set. <laughs> if I were them, that's the answer that would come back. So <laughs> I don't know. They probably got their own sets. I don't know. These things do come up on auction now and then. So it's not like that we've got a treasure that they will really be interested in. I don't know. No idea. It all depends who's running the place now and, and what it's like. I don't know. Let's look at a few more of the prints. Let me get this safely out of the way. The other thing, too, we saw, we can see the timetable. Uh, these envelopes, they are dated. Each of the envelopes, and this is also fun. There's a million little things here. The envelope for number three has a label stuck on it. The envelope for label number four and five has the date and time printed on it. So what happened? They must have got to number three. When you get to number two, there is no time or date printed on it. Envelope number three has underneath it a time and date. Yeah, it's printed on there, and then they've stuck a label on top. So they must have been running late and put the label on with the adjustment in the date. Then by the time they got to number four, they've now printed this on the envelope. We can sort of see the schedule, and it looks basically like months. This first one, where, where's my glass? I've got my glasses on. The first one. What is it here? It's Taisho 7, uh, December, the month. It's December the 23rd of Taisho 7. The next one is Taisho 8, and it's February the 24th. So that's two months later. There was eight prints in each package, eight or nine prints in each package. 
The next one now is Taisho 8, and it's now the ninth month. Whoa! That's the next package. This is package number five. So between four and five, four went out in February, and five went out in September. These guys run to a Moka Hong Kong schedule. They announce their time and date, and they miss it by half a year. The next one, package number six, is the ninth year. We've now moved into the next year. It's the ninth year, February. So maybe that was the schedule. Maybe. February. But that, no, number three was February. Number four was, was February. Oh no, number three was December, number four was February, number five was September, and number six was February. So it seems like it took time to make these things. Deadlines, deadlines, deadlines. It's like our Eight Views of Cats series. They're on the way, they're on the way, they're on the way. Let's look at a couple of prints. Let me check my mail. Still nothing from my web host. So we're still shut down, I guess, are we? Whatever. How far did we get? I oh, know there's so much to learn. We started this the other day looking at these things, but there is so much. Every one of these prints has so much information. What I didn't gather, when we looked at this the other day, I opened it up and I didn't even understand what it was. Of course, this is Itsukushima. This is the shrine at Miyajima, down at Hiroshima. When you look at the shrine over the water at Hiroshima, the shrine that's out in the water, this is the same place, That very, the most famous Tori Shrine Gate in Japan. And there must be a night festival going on there. So there's a huge amount of stuff we can look and learn from each of these, you know. Right. Well, Ken-san, good morning. How you doing, sir? I'm good. How are you? Okay, so far, I'm actually not okay, but not your problem. Okay, we got this far last week, the show, last week, the other day. Let's just flip through a few more. We've got a few minutes here just to flip through a few more before I have to get out of here and get to it. Someone says, look at the shrine braces. Yeah, I saw this and I think, Corin, somebody was talking about this. I have no idea what this is about. I'm sorry. I haven't the slightest idea. Just to let you know what people were talking about, the main shrine has the thing at the top and it's got the feet at the bottom, but there are some strange kind of little roofing tiles or something. I've got no idea. Braces or tiles, I don't know. I've never noticed these. I haven't seen these before. I don't know anything about it. Okay, let's just look at a few more. Ha! We know where this is. This is in, this is in uh, uh, Lake Biwa near Kyoto. This is one of the places that's used in the famous Hakke series, Omi Hakke. And he's even tossed in some autumn moon and some descending geese for good luck. This one's actually quite nice. We've even got, look at this, we've got rim light. My God, I don't, I can't, don't quote me on this, but this could be one of the earliest examples in Japanese art of something like rim light. This series, you know, we talked about it the other day. They were, he's exploring different ways to do shadows and stuff. And this is something that wasn't there in ukiyo-e art up until this time. And here we have moonlight actually done as a rim light on these. Look at this, white down at the bottom, getting bluer up at the top. Some of these are nice. Some of these are really nice. Some are phoned home and some are really nice. This is famous, it's called Ueno. This is not the Ueno station here in Tokyo, but there's many places in Japan that have the same name. Ueno, as in the station name here, simply means upper fields, the fields in the upper part of town somewhere. So it's a very common name we see in Japan everywhere. 
I have mixed feelings about this one too. Overall, it looks kind of cool because the white of the paper makes it look cool and the funny rocks, but I don't know about the design. I don't know. I mean, what are we looking at here? It's sort of, I don't know, whatever. It looks like those sceneries we see in China somewhere where the very high cliffs come down to the river. I don't know if it's artful or clumsy. I'm really not sure. And the guy, he just, whatever, he's a famous artist, but I don't think he does water very well. You know, I really don't think so. We see water in all of these things and rivers. And I think, I get the impression that he's struggling. Who am I? I mean, Hiroshi, famous, globally famous artist. But when I look at this stuff, I feel that the water sometimes is struggling. When I get it, he's trying to do something interesting. You can just make a blue thing and call it water and that's it. That's what was done in the eras preceding him. And that, when I say struggling, maybe he's experimenting, exploring maybe is a more polite word to do this. He's exploring with different ways to try and delineate water. And lots of lots of gradation, way more than would have been common in the ukiyo-e just a short time before this. And then the content. The picture content. How would you like to travel this way? You come up here. Hi, get in the basket, guy. Down you go, across the basket. I guess this is something that was common in cultures all over the world before bridges became built everywhere. Would you ride in this? Not me. <laughs> but back in the day, whatever. You know, you know what I'm going to say. You know what I'm going to say about this one. Absolutely. Phoned home. Just phoned in. Whatever. And again, the, the polite thing we have to say about this guy is that he probably never visited the places that are depicted in many of these prints. So a lot of it would be, uh, would be made up. You know. I see no redeeming features in this one. I'm sorry. The trees are confusing. The rocks are confusing. Everything's confusing. Use of space doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. Phoned home. There's a strikeout and there's a home run, and we've got both. So, this one's kind of nice. I mean, it doesn't make any sense for us to go through this whole thing judging Hiroshi. Yep, that's a good one, that's a bad one. It's a set all wrapped up in itself, and it gave people who would never would have a chance to go there the chance to travel around Japan and feel the mood of different places. Remember, it's an era. There's no TV, radio, magazines, movies. There's no photographs. There's no nothing. So these were made in an era where they would supply the only, the only visual way to get to different parts of Japan and see what they were like or get a feeling for the mood. They must have been extremely useful and valuable to people in that society at that time for this reason. You know, you and me can't understand. What would it have been like to live in a society that had no pictures. You walk around town each day, you don't actually see imagery. You don't see pictures. And then finally you get, you get home or you get to a shop and there's this woodblock print, you look at it, and it's the only picture you would see for days and days and days. So what kind of impact would it have on you? Your brain would do something different from us. So we're seeing these in an era where we're, we're full of imagery every minute of every day. But the people who they were made for didn't see pictures. They got up in the morning, had their breakfast. There was no pictures in front of them. There's no newspaper. They get out, go to work. No pictures. Only reality. And then at some point in the day, they get there, sit there, drink a tea. Somebody opens this package, and there is a picture. I can't. My mind just doesn't go there what the impact would be for those people. Anyway, I do have to get out of here. I've got to get back to try and work on the maintenance of the website, and I've got to get in the shop. Me and Ken are running the shop today, and we have got to get the vacuum cleaner out, get cleaned up, and start to go. There may be stress in my voice today. I guess you know why. Sorry about that. It's not so peaceful and easy today, the last few days here, and maybe there's worse coming. I don't have any ideas. I'll see you in a couple more days, Monday morning. Let's put the outside camera up. So I'm asking about the website. We're running software supplied by the web hosting company. So whatever, whatever, whatever. Nothing else I can talk about right now about this one. 
They are doing a malware scan as we speak. Hopefully within a few minutes, the site will be up and running once the malware has been identified and removed. Hopefully we'll see. But we were, did the same thing yesterday and we did the same thing two days ago. So I don't know. Okay, coffee time. Thanks very much. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye for now.